Committee will come to order. This is a uh, hearing on the improving oversight and accountability in Federal grant programs from the Oversight uh, and Government Reform Subcommittee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money that Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans des uh, deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers do have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with Citizen Watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. In a time of uh, growing Federal debt, it is essential that every area of government spending is fully transparent and beneficial to the Nation. Executive branch agencies are estimated to spend more than $50 billion annually on discretionary grants. As overall grant spending has continued to increase, Federal agencies have worked to find ways to minimize opportunities for waste, fraud and abuse in the discretionary grant programs that are to be committed for that. This hearing will initiate a series of hearings related to transparencies and effectiveness of the grant process. The subcommittee recognizes that grants are distributed based on authorizing legislation to advance a public purpose not to directly benefit the agency that is awarding the grant. Thus, an open contract model may not be appropriate. But the grantee selection process must be transparent and consistent in the pre-award and post-award phases. According to the OMB Office, from fiscal years 1990 to 2010, Federal outlays for grants to State and local governments increased from $135 billion to $608 billion, almost one-fifth of the Federal budget and 350 percent increase since fiscal year 1990. In fiscal year 2010, OMB identified 23 Federal grant-making departments and agencies that offered over 1,670 Federal grant programs. The top three agencies in terms of grant dollars outlaying during fiscal year 2010 were Departments of Health and Human Services, Transportation and Education. But it appears that there is a void of consistent grant guidelines across all agencies beyond OMB circulars. Currently, agencies do not typically disclose to grant apl applicants the criteria or factors they will use in deciding how to distribute grant funding. When agencies do disclose the criteria, they may not disclose the weighting of the various criteria. Because of the discretionary grant process, it is impenetrably opaque. It is difficult, if not impossible, for the public or oversight bodies to determine whether a Federal grant award was based on merit, the discretion of the Department or agencies, past or future employment, political financial interests, any of those areas we can determine. GAO and IG audits have examined discretionary grant award decisions. Typically, they reveal that in financial selection the decision was not documented and one could not ascertain why grant applications were funded while some others were not. So during this hearing, we plan to ask many questions. After the funds have been distributed to grantees, do agencies have effective oversight and monitoring tools? Are there vulnerabilities in the system and ways to ensure that the government's limited discretionary grant resources are used effectively? If public funds are used to pay for research, is the research deliverable publicly available? Should grants release the funds as the work is completed in multiple stages, pay at the start or pay at the end of a project? Are there ways to protect against fraud, waste and abuse like inappropriate pay scales, ghost employees, work that was never complete, etc.? How do we assure that grant funding is released to entities of the greatest need and ability rather than simply the best grant writing skills? Is there a way to see the successful and not successful grant requests so future grant writers can see what was contained in the successful grant application? Can we improve communication throughout the grant process between the agencies and the grant requesters? Are grants being written in instances when it would be more appropriate to use a contract? And is there a need to increase recipient reporting requirements to allow more transparency? This hearing will focus on asking the questions to determine if there are new ideas that exist to help all entities involved in the grant process accomplish their goals. I look forward to discovering with all parties the ideas that will help us in the future manage our Federal tax dollars the best way possible. And with that, I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Connolly, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing, uh, which might at first glance appear relatively mundane, but actually raises some important questions about the disbursement of Federal funding. First, what is the relationship between transparency of grant disbursement, auditing of grant recipients, and the efficient allocation of resources to grantees who can make the most of the funding? There may be a point at which additional and especially duplicative reporting requirements constrain grantees' ability to fulfill their own mission. And there may be a point at which additional reporting requirements frankly discourage participation by smaller entities. Finally, if we are dispersing discretionary grants to many very small entities which require labor-intensive audits, then perhaps it is more efficient to spend the money directly through the Federal agency itself. 
We should not leave unexamined the assumption that grants necessarily represent the best way to fund a particular program. Second, what is the Federal Government doing to ensure equitable distribution of grant monies? I represent two counties in Virginia, for example, one of which has a very sophisticated grant application staff and one that is less so. Both of these counties deserve fair, merit-based consideration of the grant applications, but one starts out with a distinct advantage. Lest grant monies flow disproportionately to wealthy urban counties, agencies must go out of their way to ensure that less sophisticated but equally deserving jurisdictions receive fair consideration of their applications. This kind of equitable process requires proactive outreach, just as selective colleges proactively reach out to underrepresented communities, which certainly contain talent but do not always possess the familiarity or expertise with college application processes. I am interested in hearing more about the Administration's efforts to strengthen Grants.gov and whether these efforts include reforms that will make the platform more accessible to all grant seekers. Third, what is the Federal Government doing? to avoid the imposition of unfunded mandates and reduce the reporting burden on States, localities and universities. I indicated yesterday that I do have some queasiness about the legislation this committee marked up with respect to that subject. According to the American Association of Universities, for example, fulfilling ARRA reporting requirements alone costs $7,900 per grant award, which would translate to hundreds of millions of dollars potentially in cost if ARRA type reporting requirements were established across the board for all Federal spending. At a time when States, localities and universities are facing dire fiscal challenges, we need to be cognizant to ensure that any additional reporting requirements, for good reason, for transparency, avoid the imposition, however, of an unfunded mandate and protect those entities' ability to deliver the services that our constituents need. The efficiency and transparency of grant delivery is a complex topic, and I hope that as we uh, develop legislation on this topic, we have additional hearings to consider the questions I have raised. In a cost-constrained environment, it is imperative we consider the efficient delivery of services which must be balanced against the need for transparency and include consideration of other tools beyond grants to accomplish a given objective. We, we say we are concerned about the burden of unfunded mandates. We have had a number of hearings in the subcommittee about them. We must make sure we do not even unwittingly add to them. I look forward to hearing the testimony this morning, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you for holding this hearing. And with that, I agree with uh, what you are saying on the uh, additional unfunded mandates completely on that. Members have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. Uh, we will now welcome our first panel. Uh, Ms. Jeanette uh, Frenzel is the Managing Director of the Financial Management and Assurance Team at GAO. Uh, Ms. Natalie Keegan is the analyst uh, at the Congressional Research Service specializing in American federalism and emergency management uh, policy. Ms. Cynthia Snyder is the Acting Inspector General at the Department of Justice. And uh, the Honorable Daniel Werfel is the Controller of OMB's Office of Federal Financial Management. Uh, thank you all for being here. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses are sworn in at the uh, OGR committee, so I would ask you all to be able to stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony you are about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? Let the record reflect all witnesses answering the affirmative. Thank you. You may be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, I would ask that each of you limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will, of course, be made part of the record. Uh, we would like to recognize you for five minutes. I, I know all of you have been around the hearings before at different times, and uh, you are familiar with your red, yellow, and green lights there in front of you, but we would be uh, very honored to be able to receive your testimony. Ms. Frenzel. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to discuss issues related to improving Federal grants processes. Today I will highlight the results from a range of reports that we have issued regarding weaknesses in Federal grants management and accountability, including the single audit process. The Administration also recognizes concerns with these processes and has included improving grants management as part of its initiative to eliminate waste and has various related efforts underway. Today I will discuss the significance of Federal grant funding, the related risks and vulnerabilities, and improvements needed to make the single audit process an effective accountability mechanism. The Federal Government's use of grants to achieve national objectives and to respond to emerging trends in demographics and threats to homeland security has grown significantly in the last two decades. 
In fiscal year 2010, Federal grant awards to States and local governments totaled over $600 billion, according to historical data from the President's budget. Also in fiscal year 2010, over 1,670 grant programs were offered by at least 23 Federal grant-making departments and agencies. And as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the top three agencies in terms of grant dollars are the Departments of Health and Human Services, Transportation, and Education. Our work over a number of years has pointed out risks and vulnerabilities that exist in the Federal grants process. We found weaknesses in the control systems of Federal awarding agencies at all points in the grant life cycle. Specifically, in the pre-award and award processes, our audits found that agencies awarded grants without adequately documenting the selection process. In some instances, we found agencies did not perform pre-award reviews until after the grants had been awarded. In other cases, the documentation was not sufficient to show key decisions that were made in the competitive award process, including decisions about evaluation criteria and selection. In the implementation phase, we found weaknesses in agency monitoring of recipients' use of funds, including identifying and managing grantee risks and properly overseeing grantee financial practices and program management. We have also reported the need for agencies to assist recipients in improving subrecipient monitoring when Federal funds are passed through one entity to another. Grant closeout procedures have also been a longstanding problem. These procedures are used for detecting problems that have occurred in recipient financial management and program operations. Closeout procedures are intended to ensure that recipients have met all financial requirements, provided financial reports, and returned any unused funds to the Federal Government. We have also reported on government-wide issues related to grants, including undisbursed Federal funding in expired grant accounts and improper payments in Federal grant programs. Finally, I will discuss the audit mechanism for grants, which is the single audit. Over the past several years, we have reported significant concerns with the single audit process and have called for improvements to make single audits a more effective accountability mechanism over Federal grant funding while possibly simplifying and streamlining the process. Single audit reports on the financial statements uh, and internal controls over compliance with laws and grant provisions for grantees that spend more than $500,000 of Federal funding in a given year. The largest grantees subject to these requirements are State and local governments. Through our work, we found that the Federal oversight structure is not adequate to monitor the single audit process and results, and the timeframes do not facilitate the timely correction of audit findings at grantees. In addition, single audit stakeholders, including the States, have raised concerns about the complexity and relative costs and benefits of the single audit requirements as currently designed. We also found that Federal agencies do not systematically use audit findings to identify risks related to grant programs and individual grantees. We also identified concerns regarding the need for OMB to issue its single audit guidance in a more timely manner in order to help facilitate audit planning for the many States and local governments that have fiscal year ends of June 30. It is important to note that complexities and weaknesses in the Federal grant management and single audit processes have a serious impact on State and local governments, in addition to presenting risks over the effective and efficient use of Federal funding. Enhancing accountability and oversight at all levels is important, and improvement and modernization efforts should also be mindful of the scarce resources at all levels of government and the shared intergovernmental responsibilities that we have. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you or the subcommittee members may have. Thank you very much. Ms. Keegan. Good morning, Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the committee. My name is Natalie Keegan, and I am an analyst in, in American Federalism and Emergency Management Policy at the Congressional Research Service. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning on improving oversight and accountability in Federal grant programs. I have submitted my full statement for the record. I have three observations about how agency discretion influences transparency at the pre-award phase of Federal grants. Federal grantor agencies have the discretion to disclose information about the grants administration process 
And yet, for most Federal agencies and most grants, there isn't a clear picture of how grants are selected, the specific details of grants applications is not disclosed, and it, it is unclear exactly what is contained in grant formulas used to distribute funds. For, for grant applications and grant applicants, lack of transparency may result in the inability uh, to direct resources in the most efficient manner when seeking Federal grants. For Congress, lack of transparency makes it difficult to measure grant program efficiency, effectiveness, and economy. Let me expand on these observations. Pre-award oversight activities include congressional grant program authorizations and appropriations, determinations of eligibility and eligible activities, review of announcements of funding availability, and reviewing of panel scorings of eligible applications. While recent congressional debate has involved post-award activities, particularly recipient and agency reporting requirements, consideration of agency discretion for the pre-award activities may provide insight into improving oversight and accountability in Federal grants. My first observation is that there isn't a clear picture of how grants are selected. Federal agencies generally have the authority to establish the criteria for evaluating discretionary grant applications. There appears to be no consistency in the criteria within and across agencies. Agencies are required to provide criteria when they publish the Notice of Funds Availability in the Federal Register. However, the information provided generally does not include a concise list of evaluation factors and specifically how those factors will be weighted during the scoring of the application. In some cases, grant applications are reviewed by a panel and scored on a scale of 0 to 100. The scores are then used to prioritize applications for funding. The agencies, however, are not bound by the review panel scores, and the scores generally are not disclosed to either the grant applicants or the public. My second observation is that the specific details of grant applications is not disclosed. Almost always, grantor agencies consider some of the information in the grant applications to be proprietary information. As a result, generally agencies will not disclose details in the grant applications without the permission of the applicant. This applies to both funded and unfunded applications. My final observation is that it is unclear exactly what is included in the grant formulas used to distribute funds. There is currently no single source providing information on grant formulas used to distribute funds, including information about the formula factors and how they are weighted. This was not always the case. The General Services Administration is responsible for maintaining and providing access to information on Federal grants through a computerized information system. This access is through CFDA.gov. At one time, the GSA Administrator was also required to provide to Congress specific information on each grant distribution formula in a report titled Formula Report to the Congress. This report is no longer available. The report was discontinued under the Federal Reports Elimination and Sunset Act of 1995. There is no other comparable Federal report that provides this level of detail on Federal grant formulas. In conclusion, a closer examination of agency pre-award grant activities and the amount of agency discretion in these activities may assist in the determination of whether increased agency discretion warrants increased transparency. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and would be happy to answer any questions the Committee may have. Thank you. Ms. Schneider. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Connolly, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today about improving oversight and accountability in Federal grant programs. I will focus my remarks on the Department of Justice, but the findings that we have made concerning the Department of Justice are typical of those that are described by the other panel members that are found across the government. Grants management has long been a challenge for the Department of Justice, and the Department has faced heightened challenges since 2009 because of the increase in grant funding that it received under the Recovery Act. Given the large volume of grant funding traditionally awarded by the Department, the Department of Justice, Office of the Inspector General, has long focused on providing oversight of the Department's activities in this area. Our audits have found that the Department has made a concerted effort in the past three years to improve its regular grant management practices. 
The Department has responded positively to recommendations we have made in our audits and in a best practices guide that we provided them called Improving the Grants Management Process. In particular, the Department made significant improvements in its monitoring and oversight of grants, particularly due to its staffing of its Office of Audit Assessment and Management. While OAAM was created by statute in 2005 to improve the Department's oversight of its grants programs, we reported in 2008 that the Department had not devoted sufficient effort to staffing this office so that it could perform its mission. However, we found in an audit issued in March of this year that they have made significant progress since 2008. That office is now fully staffed, and it has implemented a reasonable process for monitoring the high volume of grants that it is responsible for monitoring. While we believe the Department has taken positive steps towards improving its grants management practices, these changes will take time to fully implement and to incorporate into the Department's regular practices. Our work has continued to identify areas where the Department could further improve its management of grants, particularly in terms of its process for awarding grants and its oversight. For example, in recent audit reports, we found instances where the Department either used incorrect scoring formulas or made scoring errors while reviewing grant applications. We also found instances where the Department treated applicants inconsistently, allowing some grant applications to be given further consideration for awards even though they were missing key documentation, while denying other applicants further consideration for the same deficiencies. Our recent audits also found some Department agencies do not consistently document the rationale for discretionary awards, despite recommendations that they should do so, and in some instances do not explain why applications ranked lower by peer reviewers receive grants over those that were ranked higher. The, the Department and we found that the Department should be taking additional steps to ensure adequate screening for conflicts of interest on the part of peer reviewers who are assessing the grant applications. The Department has agreed with the recommendations we made and is working to implement procedures to help ensure these issues do not reoccur. In addition, our audits of individual grant recipients have found deficiencies such as failing to segregate payroll duties failure and failure to employ sufficient staff with the training and experience to properly manage the grants. We have recommended that the Department provide additional training and, to, and oversight of these grant recipients. We also believe that the Department should take further action to address outstanding recommendations to resolve question costs from our audits of grantees. While the Department frequently is able to implement our audit recommendations within a year or two, some of our audit recommendations have lingered for years without being resolved, despite our frequent reminders for the Department to do so. While the Department works to improve its grant management processes, we will continue with our important mission of providing oversight of the Department's efforts in this area. We also will continue with our leadership of the Grant Fraud Committee, which is part of the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force. Through the Grant Fraud Committee, we have issued a best practices guide for all Federal grants managers, and we have developed and are continuing to develop additional training courses for agents, auditors, grant managers, and grantees. In conclusion, we will continue to work with the Department and external agencies to help reduce risks associated with Federal grants. We believe the Department is demonstrating a commitment to improving its grants management process, and we have seen significant signs of improvement in this area. However, further improvements are needed and considerable work remains to be done before managing the billions of dollars that the Department awards annually in grants is no longer a top challenge for the Department. This concludes my prepared statement, and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Werfel. Thank you, Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee for the invitation to discuss with you today the Federal grant management process and how the Federal Government can improve its oversight and accountability in Federal grant programs. The Federal Government annually awards grants totaling roughly $600 billion, which is one-sixth of the total Federal budget. The Federal Government, therefore, has a fundamental responsibility to be effective stewards of these dollars. The Office of Management and Budget, working with Federal grant-making agencies and non-Federal stakeholders, establishes policies and initiates reforms to ensure that relevant program requirements are being met, strong internal controls for reducing waste, fraud and error are in place, and that grantees are meeting their responsibility for performance and accountability for grant awards. My written testimony provides background on relevant policies such as cost allocation, single audit, improper payment review, and Transparency Act reporting, 
all of which are intended to drive accountability, integrity, and transparency in the use of Federal grant dollars. For example, when single audits are conducted effectively, the audit results, which are available on a public websi a website, are instrumental in identifying and correcting noncompliance with laws and regulations, including improper payments and other financial management deficiencies. A good example of this is in the Medicaid program, where more than a billion dollars in disallowed costs have been identified for recovery over the past several years as a result of single audit activities. In each of the areas I have identified, we have initiatives in place to improve the overall impact of these policies. I would like to highlight a few of these areas where, in some cases, recent successes provide a critical foundation for sustained progress moving forward. First, in the area of improper payments, prevention and recapture, the Federal Government's error rate declined in fiscal year 2010, helping agencies avoid roughly $4 billion, excuse me, $4 billion in improper payments. An important factor in this reduction was improvement in the Medicaid error rate, the Government's largest grant program. Since the President took office, eliminating improper payments has been a major focus of his administration. In November 2009, the President issued an executive order that initiated a comprehensive approach to improving results in this area, including transparency through a new website, paymentaccuracy.gov, and the appointment of senior accountable officials responsible for coordinating improper payment efforts at their agency. A subsequent Presidential directive called for an increase in improper payment recoveries from contractors. Federal agencies responded by recovering $687 million in improper payments, more than three times the amount from the previous year. In 2010, the recently enacted Improper Payments Elimination Recovery Act further strengthened accountability on all aspects of improper payments and provided new authorities, in particular providing Federal agencies new authorities to recover improper grant payments. We are now working with agencies to make sure they leverage these new authorities to recover payments uh, that have been improperly paid to grantees. Second, and related to improper payments, OMB is working with the Recovery Board and Federal agencies to utilize cutting-edge fraud detection capabilities to enhance uh, accountability and eliminate fraud in Federal award spending. As you know, the Recovery Board has initiated very successful and effective solutions for tracking fraud and error. We have initiated, initiated pilots of these tools with other agencies, and I would like to highlight that the President recently signed an executive order called Delivering an Efficient, Effective and Accountable Government, which established a new oversight and accountability board, the Government Accountability and Transparency Board. This board will help us make sure that the tools and lessons learned from the Recovery Board in areas such as fraud detection and transparency are effectively carried forward to the rest of government. Last, in the area of transparency, bolstered by the successful transparency initiatives in the Recovery Act, OMB has initiated requirements for the reporting of subaward information on all Federal spending. USAspending.gov provides the public with increased vis visibility into Federal spending beyond the prime recipient level. As I noted earlier, this is just a highlight of some of our work to improve results in Federal grants. We look forward to working closely with this committee to ensure the effective implementation of current and future transparency and accountability efforts to ensure that Federal grant programs are accountable for taxpayer dollars. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you to all of you. And I recognize myself for five minutes for question time. Uh, Ms. Frenzel, thank you for what you are bringing to us. Let me just mention a couple of things. You mentioned that there is an uh, the, uh, the tracking of the unused funds, uh, that when a grant is complete and that the closeout procedures on that, do we have any idea how often we have funds returned to us to say, I, we, we requested $100,000 and we only used $80,000, here is your $20,000 back? Well, actually, our work in that area was um, to look at funds that had not been drawn down uh, by the grantees. It had been obligated by the Federal agencies for drawdown, and the grant period had passed, and for whatever reason, the grant uh, amount was not closed out or drawn down. So we don't know if the grantee didn't finish the, the program or if right. there was some kind of a problem, et cetera. Um, what this indicates, and we found this in 325 uh, different Federal programs, is it indicates a grant closeout problem. And so 
part of getting unused Federal funds returned to the Federal Government would also be part of the closeout process. So, no, I can't answer questions about how much maybe should have been returned and wasn't, but I think we are fairly confident in saying that there are some issues with the closeout process, and that is what would uh, be included in the closeout process. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kagan, you, you had mentioned a, a couple of things on it. One is you, you made a comment about there is no clear um, uh, picture of how the grants are selected in that process and, and how we go through that. The review panel scores aren't necessarily used and that, that type of thing. And then you mentioned a formula report back coming back to, to Congress that that was sunset in 1995. Obviously, grants have dramatically increased in that time period. Is it your recommendation that you are making to this group that we do have some kind of formula report coming back to Congress again? I think when considering uh, the issue of transparency in Federal grants, certainly an investigation into what information is available and what information would be useful uh, is, is something for Congress to, uh, to evaluate. The report does provide a great deal of information, or did provide, um, about the specific calculations in the formulas. There isn't anything available now. It is really up to Congress to decide whether they need that information or not. Okay. Mr. Warfold, there are a lot of circulars that are out there in executive orders that give instructions to the agencies. Do you see a need to be able to gather those different circulars together and, for consistency's sake, administration and administration, codify some of those and say these have been either through several administrations or through trial and error in your own administration to be able to determine these are good ideas to get some baseline standards for grant writing? Uh it, well, gen let me start by saying, Mr. Chairman, generally, um, I think the overall concept of cleaning up um, the variety of different requirements that are out there, uh, whether issued through memorandum or circular, some of which is pushed into the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, some of which isn't, I think is an important suggestion that we should consider. It is a, uh, a, a complex array of, of requirements that exist today, and I think there would be some benefit in reconciling some of that. Is there the possibility to be able to gather together some of those things that you would say th this is a series of maybe 50 different ideas or whatever it may be, that these should be looked at and examined? These there are our top areas uh, that we suggest in it that we could get to this committee. Uh, yeah, well, it, there's some of it that's um, that, that's legislative, and therefore I think we could tee up for this committee as as being impactful. I mean, there's a couple of dimensions I think to this question. On the one hand, we're trying to improve these policies and make them more impactful. Right. So, for example, in the area of single audit, we have ongoing working groups that extend across federal agencies and into state governments, into both programmatic and audit communities within state governments, asking the fundamental questions that GAO raised in their testimony in terms of how can we make sure sure that these single audits are getting to the right issues right. and the results are being used. There are other questions um, in terms of making sure that we are presenting clear policies right. uh, so, assuming we of, have the right policies. Right. Some of it is just a consistency basis so that if you are agency to agency, you know there are standard and criteria. And I am not talking about creating a whole FAR system for grants, uh, but some sort of consistent system that we know if you are going after a Federal grant, this is a given. Uh, all of these factors have to go into the background line. Let, let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. Uh, has OMB done any kind of uh, studies or documents uh, to be able to study the grant process that you have in draft form or in a final form that this committee could get to be able to see some of the work that you are doing to be able to research grants and how grants are done? I don't think we have anything specifically off the shelf, but we have a lot of work and it wouldn't, I don't think it would be a, a big lift for us to put together something for you. If we get that, even if it's in draft form at this point, and so we can get a chance to take a look at it and see some of the ideas that you are building as well in your own research, because I am sure OMB is tracking this as well, and uh, to be able to look at it and say, okay, what, what is being done? How is it being handled currently? Yeah, there are certainly particular areas right now that we are very uh, invested in trying to improve, including single audit, grants.gov, and other areas. Great. Well, we will follow up with you on, on requesting those specific documents to me, and we will come back whether it be draft or, or final reports on that. With that, I yield to Mr. Conley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before my five minutes begins, uh, if I might be uh, given the point of personal privilege, and I know Mr. Kelly will join me in this, we want to congratulate you on uh, your recent win. Your dog, Liberty, won the People's Choice at the Humane Society. My dog, Abigail, is still in recovery from her loss to Liberty. But she sends her best wishes and congratulations. Well, I, I will pass on that to my dog, Liberty. <laughs> uh, Ms. Keegan, uh, your testimony is pretty compelling about the fact that there seems to be almost no rhyme or reason within the Federal Government for grant giving. I mean, each agency may have a reason and may have its own formula and may have its own process. But I mean, we 
we have no standardized transparency system. We have no standardized set of criteria. We have no standardized policy with respect to uh, whether someone can, in fact, look at whether they won or, or lost and why. As you know, you frankly have more transparency in the contracting system than you do in what you described in uh, in the grant giving system, and and you know. We sort of are juggling, it seems to me, in this hearing and, and this committee with, with two sets of responsibilities. One is on the receiving end. Are they accountable? Are they using the money for the purposes intended? Is it efficacious? But we also need to focus on the grant giving side, it seems to me. And one of the, you know, listening to you, I, I, I'm persuaded, gosh, we got to be able to do better than that. That's not very professional. But on the other hand, what I, what I worry about is that in our desire to be more transparent and to try to make sure that this is a process that is accountable as it should be, we, you know, government tends to want one size fits all, because that is easier. And so we are going to treat the grant to the bench lab scientist the same as a grant to, you know, a local government to build a highway. And they aren't the same thing. And we have to recognize the distinction. Uh, your reaction? Well, Mr. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think that the interesting thing on your point is that there are a great deal of variations across grant programs. And I'll give you a specific example. I cover the Department of Homeland Security grants at, at CRS. Um, one of the elements that I mentioned in my testimony is regarding disclosure of information in the grant applications themselves. Beyond the issue of proprietary information uh, for the Department of Homeland Security grants, it could be uh, argued that some of that information may not um, ideally be disclosed in the interest of national security. Uh, it's, it's really up to Congress to, to weigh that and decide uh, which programs or all programs or just a, a certain a selection of categories of programs need that kind of uniformity and transparency, or whether you, you need to uh, balance you know, the particular intent of the programs and the information that might be available uh, with the overall goal of transparency. So I, I, do, I do agree that there are, uh, there is definitely a need to, to create that balance. And, you know, and when you look at uniformity, there are some things that you can do uh, where there might not be you know, as many issues. Um, to, to address as there are in others where uniformity, for instance, in reporting the scores uh, or other things where there is not so much detail that um, there is a risk to a national goal or national security. Um, Mr. Werfel, and welcome back to this committee. I almost think you are a member of our staff. Uh, you come with such frequency, and thank you for being so responsive. How will the government address the issue of data integrity? in the Federal spending related to acquisition management, grant management and the like? It is it's a huge issue uh, because um, the value of the information that is up on public websites such as USAspending.gov and Recovery.gov is so dramatically diminished if we don't have confidence in the quality and the reliability of the information. I think in this regard the Recovery Act really positioned us well to, to do a better job more globally. Uh, we had um, an information collection system that had built-in controls over time that got better and better to make sure that information reported in by recipients was more valid. A good example of that is in the early part of the Recovery Act when uh, the system would accept any version of congressional district and so mistakes were made. Well, we got smarter and now the system, if you type in the wrong congressional district, it won't let you type that in. So that, I tell that story to say the systems that we capture the information can be made better and the Recovery Act uh, has a lesson learned there. And we also had a very dedicated process during the Recovery Act where Federal agencies over a short period of time really focused on data anomalies and mistakes in the data and made sure that the information going on recovery.gov was accurate. And of course, the public was very important in pointing out errors. The key is, can we do the same thing bro more broadly on USAspending.gov and learn those lessons? And we have already started to do that. And one of the challenges is that you need to invest in systems in order to make those improvements, so we have to do investments within our current resource constraints. But in particular, we are working with agencies to kind of carry forward things that have worked well in the Recovery Act in terms of data reliability and having them do a better job reviewing their USA spending information. 
Thank you. Thank you. I recognize uh, Mr. Meehan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks each of you for your tremendous work in this in this area, which um, is something that Congress is just not paying enough attention to. And as we are dealing with it, with the requirement to be faithful stewards of the of the of the government fisc, I thank you for taking the time to point out many of the places where some opportunities arise. I think I'm stunned by the observation, Ms. Francel, in your report of some close to $125 billion in improper payments that are made. How do we begin to put our arms around that kind of a, of a number and look for ways in which we can capture that before those dollars go out the door? That estimate that you cite covers uh, various Federal programs. Not all of them are grant programs, but in the top ten, five of those are, in fact, grant programs. So uh, grant programs are certainly included in the estimate of improper payments government-wide. Uh, we and OMB have been uh, certainly working uh, closely on this matter. And uh, we are really at a point where we need to get to the next step on improper payments. Over the past several years, the government has made a lot of progress in terms of monitoring and measuring uh, the amount of improper payments out there. At this point, um, we really need to get at the causes of those improper payments so that those causes could then be remedied in order to prevent improper payments from happening. Can you give me an example of something that you would point to that people would understand is a, is a cause that we aren't following up on? Certainly. Um, there are many different types of improper payments, and in fact, sometimes uh, something is categorized as an improper payment because there is no documentation available uh, to verify that the payment should have been made. So in that case, we are really not sure if the, pre if the payment should have been made or not. And so in those cases, it is important to figure out why. Why is there not documentation? Uh, in other cases, a program might be giving payments to ineligible recipients, and then it is important to ask why and how is that happening. And, and in some cases, it may be weak controls uh, at the uh, agency or organization uh, that is really signing uh, up recipients for a program. In other cases, it could be that the program design is so difficult to implement uh, that, in fact, sometimes it is not always clear if somebody is eligible. So there can be a wide range of causes, and I think across agencies and programs, um, the Federal Government needs to get a handle on these causes so that the problems can be fixed and, and so that improper payments can be prevented. We, w Congressman, uh, we, we were talking uh, just the other night, Jim and myself, about uh, Congressman Langford, uh, just about this opportunity, but these are the kinds of things that we need to work with you on so that we can have some sort of measure of accountability as we go along. We do an awful lot of pay and chase as opposed to what I used to do work as a corporate attorney. And in, in a lot of the contract field, there would be requirements that, that would, would have to be met, and then we would pay the next installment. Do we do enough of that in, in government contracting now or other kinds of grant programs in which there has to be an accountability that is almost contemporaneous with the release of the next line of funding? It really is a delicate balance. So, for instance, in Medicaid, um, the, the payments do need to get out so that uh, medical services mm -hmm. can be continued to be provided. So there needs to be a good balance of right. controls up front uh, along with getting payments out. And, in fact, we at GAO are starting uh, some work in the near future on looking at the Medicaid program. Uh, we are also currently working on foster care uh, to really drill down and take a look at uh, what are some of the causes of improper payments, and then matching that up with some of the initiatives that are ongoing. There are many initiatives ongoing in government, but we really need to match all of this up. And, and you hear parent. oftentimes from physicians and others that there's late payments for them. They perform the service, and then they carry for a long period of time. Let me ask one last question of anybody on the panel, if you did. When I was a prosecutor, U.S. Attorney's Office, we used to make a lot of use of the key TAM laws, in which people were awarded a percentage of a, a recovery that they brought to the attention of the government. This goes all the way back, of course, as you well know, to the Civil War era. Do we make use of that in the kind of programs that we have, not the big-ticket government programs which we found our benefit, but how do we use that capacity 
to be able to have others be eyes and ears to help us identify some of this 125, the remarkable $125 billion in wrongful payments? Uh, Any panelist? The, yeah, thank, uh, you. thank you, Congressman, for the question um, and the opportunity to respond. Um, dating back to 2002, Congress created a, a provision that enabled Federal agencies to basically hire contingency-based contractors to go and help them find their imp uh, improper payments and recover it. It was limited to, to improper payments to vendors. So the way it would work is an agency would make, let's say they made, you know, $10 million to payments to contractors in a given year, they would hire a specialized audit firm to come in. They wouldn't have to pay that audit firm, only pay them out of the percentages of improper payments that they identify were made to the contractor. That has been a very successful program. It was so successful that the Medicare program initiated it. So now we were moving beyond contractors, and now Medicare can hire these specialized auditors to go into hospitals and pull out these improper payments and get paid out of a portion of that. Now that has been expanded to Medicaid, and with the recent enactment of new improper payments legislation, we have it for all activities. So we are right at this cusp moment where we are trying to build on the successes we have had preliminarily with contractor improper payments and transition it to grant improper payments and elsewhere. Mr. Chairman, I know I am over my time, but may I just ask one more question on that point? Yes, sir, are, are we able to utilize current technology to see outliers in what are patterns of payments? And I use, again, a Medicare or Medicaid situation in which you would see somebody that is doing an inordinate amount of billing for a particular issue in a geographic or demographic area that by its, its suspect just by its very, you know, its very number. Uh, absolutely, Congressman. Uh, uh, there is good news and bad news there. The very good news is that we, for the first time, have had significant breakthrough. Uh, the Recovery Board uh, took technology that was generally used in uh, law enforcement and in intelligence and also used by credit card companies to look for payment anomalies and deployed it for the first time that I am aware of in a very systemic way over all Recovery Act dollars. And they have been able to do things that, that me in 14 years in Federal service had never seen and a lot of agencies hadn't seen. So we are piloting that solution. The bad news is that we are in the embryonic phase of this across government and that agencies are going to have to ramp up. We are low on the learning curve right now in terms of deploying these types of technologies, but the Recovery Board's deployment was a significant breakthrough, and I think it is going to give us some momentum for programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Thank you. Thanks for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I recognize Mr. Kelly for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank the panel for appearing. Uh, Mr. Vorfel, you, you described earlier the US, uh, USA Spending.gov as a way of, of including you know, the, the, the public visibility on, on the grant spending. Describe that a little bit and how, how, does that, how does that work? How does that increase the visibility for folks? Well, it is, it's, it's, in my experience, one of the more critical ways in which the, the, the citizenry can have an understanding of what is going on with taxpayer dollars. The way it works is that all payments, essentially greater than $25,000, are submitted into this uh, into this warehouse and pulled onto this website so that it is searchable. So you can type in Yale University or ABC Company or the State of Arizona and see all the payments that these various entities have received. And you can look at them in different categories and have an understanding of a description of how that money is being used. It enables people to understand within their local communities where the Federal dollars are going and, and how they are being used. And Recovery.gov just took that to the next level and provided way more granularity and detail than we, we seen before. Uh, so now the website, you, you, can, you can see where the, uh, the grant was made, but does it track the progress that is being made? Uh, it does not. It is more of a capture of who got the money and what was the intended use of the money, but it doesn't necessarily tell you progress, whereas Recovery.gov goes a little bit deeper into um, progress points, in particular job uh, impacts in terms of job creation. Okay. So, I mean, it would be helpful, I think, if we, if we could also track the spending and get some more of a universal recipient tracking it. But also, you, you mentioned earlier about the, the President's executive order on the, the Government Accountability and Transparency Board. But under that, their only, their only responsibility really is to write a report and release it six months from now, where the Data Act is going to shed more light on it and, and be a much better tracking vehicle. Help me with that a little bit, if you would. 
with the Board itself and what its, what its function is? I think the fundamental uh, there's a couple of fundamental purposes of the new board that the EO created. One is we have right now a recovery board that's in place that has a lot of lessons learned, a lot of infrastructure technology skills that they've developed, and we have to figure out how to marshal that through to the future. Currently, the recovery board is set to expire uh, September 30, 2013. So as good stewards of the taxpayer dollar and, and good public policy uh, personnel, we want to make sure that we have a plan for how we are going to transition past September 30, 2013 and make sure that these practices are, don't go to waste and are carried forward. And this board is going to help us marshal the types of steps that we need to take to, to conduct that transition. The other, I think, primary purpose of this group is to help us uh, provide more integrated strategic leadership on transparency and accountability by bringing together the best and brightest of the CFO, management, and inspector general community for a dedicated presidentially directed purpose around how can we enhance transparency and accountability. It is going to help us give that strategic roadmap. We may need Congress's help in developing legislation that helps us execute on that strategic roadmap, but I think it is important that we get started on that planning and figuring out what the right next steps are. Okay. And I think the Data Act adds, adds an awful lot of, uh, of uh, credibility to that whole, that whole process. You know, I just wanted to go back, Ms. Franzo and uh, Ms. Keegan. You know, the pre-award process uh, concerns me greatly because uh, I, I'm not exactly sure. How do the agencies determine whether a contract or grant is the appropriate vehicle and what are the implications of this decision? Because the pre-award seems to be critical. I will start and I will let Ms. Keegan finish. Um, well, first of all, not all grants are competitive. So there are some grant programs out there that are not competitive, are, are not uh, competed. So, uh, but for those that are competitive, it is important to determine whether the grantee has the financial management capabilities to track the use of the Federal funds, uh, as well as the programmatic capabilities to actually successfully carry out the program. And then each grant program also has its own specific requirements. So it's really really the upfront determination uh, that a particular candidate would be successful in carrying out a Federal program with Federal funds. Congressman, I also think that it is important to point out that the purposes of, of grants and contracts is a little bit different. You know, and grants are generally to support a public purpose or a national goal uh, through the authorization uh, of uh, funds to a particular grant program. Contracting has a little bit of a different purpose. So I think when agencies, uh, they, they don't I think because the intent of the different vehicles is different, uh, the approach to what should be funded with the different vehicles is different. Okay. Well, and, and I know this in my private life, you know, that when we put together and we structure these RFPs, as it were, it, it is so critical that we have exact language in there that really leads people to be able to either get a grant or a contract. And I, and I, I worry sometimes that we, as we talk about all this, there is such an inconsistency in the way we do all this. It's, and it really doesn't make sense to a lot of us as to how we actually get to these ends. Congressman, at one point in my career I was a grants writer uh, as well for local governments. And it, it is a challenge when you are trying to uh, direct the resources uh, as best you can as a small entity, whether a public entity or a nonprofit, uh, to be able to best identify what the criteria is and that is going to be considered what was funded in the past, uh, what what the real goal of the grant program is in, in very specific detail. Uh, all of that information is helpful for grant writers uh, in order to best use their resources. Okay. Thank you. I would like to take a, a couple of moments just to do a few follow-up questions, and then we are going to transition to our second panel. Uh, and I do appreciate you all coming to get a chance to be here. Uh, Mr. Werfel, I want to be able to follow up on something Mr. Kelly uh, mentioned about the contracts versus grants. Uh, how comfortable are you? that the agencies are not using a grant when they should use a contract because the grant process is easier than a contracting process. But we are receiving a deliverable, whether it be a report or research report or something else, we really should be doing a contract rather than a grant on that. Are you comfortable in that? Well, I am not. A, first of all, I think there, there is um, sufficient 
guidance that I have used and helped advise, uh, both coming out of OMB and I think there are some uh, Comptroller General positions that are in the literature that help an agency determine whether this situation is appropriately awarded as a grant versus a contract. Um, I think Congress uh, can often be helpful there in terms of signaling its congressional intent for how the money can be spent. Right, we just had a dramatic increase in the number of grants, and I'm, I'm just trying to probe and see if yeah. you are comfortable at this point that we are not just seeing people that should be writing contracts for yeah, grants. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any systemic issue in that area. Okay. On the, on the grants.gov uh, site, and obviously as that is building up and adding in some of the recovery.gov uh, elements into it. Uh, the self-reporting and, again, what Mr. Kelly was talking about before about trying to get into uh, the details of how it is going, but also if there is a deliverable at the end of it. So not only know that it was awarded uh, and how much it was awarded to, but if there was some report, if there was some response back to it, is it possible to have that at the end as well uh, so that Americans, whoever it may be, could look over the shoulder in the years to come and say, we, we awarded it to this for this amount and this was the deliverable at the end? Absolutely. I think an important step that Congress recently took was the passage of the GPRA Modernization Act, which um, updated requirements that we have to report on performance goals. And the last time that that law was uh, enacted, I think it was first enacted in the early 90s. We obviously live in a very different world in terms of technology and how information can be provided in more real time. Our challenge right now as a Federal Government is to synthesize all these various efforts and technologies. We have more information on where the dollars are going and who is getting it than we have had before. The technologies we have to report that information and make it searchable and usable are, are good. Uh, we need to improve the quality. And as you said, we need to figure out how to find the right synergy so that when you are reading this information, you are not just learning that X and Y University got a, a grant, you are learning what the, what the impact has been. And that is really taking, I think, spending transparency to the next level, and we need right. to move in that direction. Right. And that is what we have talked about before, just a single portal. <clears throat> Excuse me for this. A single portal where people can go to be able to do their research on it. Uh, two quick things, and then we're going to switch to the next panel. But the the, the payment time period, uh, a couple have brought up on how we make payments, whether that is as we go along, or whether that is at the beginning or is at the end. Uh, I have spoken to people that are in very small communities that may be getting a grant uh, for, let's say, a water treatment to do some of the certification. That grant uh, payment comes at the end. Uh, so a very small community in a very poor area has to come up with a quarter million dollars with the promise that the Federal Government will pay at the end, but they are having to go get bank loans and to chase down and, and literally go put their, uh, their city park on collateral uh, for something that will be paid at the end uh, when the process is complete. Uh, that kind of ordering is something that I would think needs to be examined in the grant process as well. And then, Mr. Werfel, you brought up the issue of uh, trying to deal with fraud after the fact uh, by what could affectionately be called fraud bounty hunters uh, that go out there after different companies to be able to find areas where there is fraud and then they are paid a percentage of what they find. The challenge of that and the benefit of it is obviously they are going to go find fraud. The challenge of it is they are in an adversarial role from the moment they walk through the door, that immediately when they walk through the door, whatever entity that they are evaluating with, they are going to be paid if they find something wrong. And so they are going to stay until they find something wrong. And uh, that puts every single grant recipient at a very difficult position uh, because you will have human error at some point and they will stay until they find it. And now you have an adversarial role. Instead of the Federal Government being your ally, now suddenly the Federal Government is your enemy uh, walking through your doors. Instead of serving that company, uh, we are now at odds with them based on a bounty hunter that we said is going to go find something. Uh, so we have to be able to resolve that process because I have numerous people back in the district that are very frustrated with those companies that step in that they know are paid to find the issues and they will stay until they do, no matter how small, and they will find them to the max that they can possibly do it. So that is just an issue we are going to need to work through in the days to come. And with that, do you have a further comment? Uh, if comment? I could just add, um, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I want to reemphasize, just as we are looking for transparency and accountability on the receiving end of grants, I think Ms. Keegan's testimony really underscores we got to look at the possibility of waste uh, at the front end. Um, some more accountability, if not standardization, within the Federal family uh, may very well help us reduce improper payments at the front end rather than having to collect them at the receiving end. Thank you. And with that, I thank this panel very much for not only the time that you spend in preparing your written statements but coming here for the oral uh, statements and your questions as well. We will now take a short recess so we can transition to our second panel.